Hey everybody, it's Kirst, and today I wanted to bless you with my PoE Necropolis League journey. I wrapped up my league experience a few days ago, and I'm currently in the process of trying out a few different games. And I wanted to share how my experience went, because it was really interesting to me. It had a bunch of cool highlights that I wanted to share with everybody. Let's start with before the season even started. Uh, even before the patch notes came out for this season, I knew I wanted to play a mana stacking hero fan. I'd done some research even during the previous season, and so I knew that's what I wanted to try out. The uh, archetype appealed to me. I'd played a mana stacking build in last epoch, so I knew I wanted to try something like that in PoE as well. And then the patch notes came out, and they buffed Archmage support gem significantly. So it was for sure time for me to try this out. It was even better than it was before. In fact, maybe it wasn't such a good thing because a lot of the mana stacking items became a lot more expensive during the season because of the buffs. And for those that don't know, I played PoE in season 23, Affliction season, and prior to that, I hadn't played in like 10 years. So I had taken a massive break. I was pretty much a complete noob cake into the game. So I needed some prep. I needed to get better at the game and so I started practicing um, running the campaign because the first walkthrough, the first run of the campaign during Affliction took me like 20-30 hours. Of course, I was going very slowly, I was experiencing the Affliction theme mechanic and uh, just going into every single Affliction woods pretty much. So that slowed me down quite a bit. I was over leveled by 5 plus levels in a lot of the zones so this time I knew a little bit better what to do so i started prepping and two three days before the season started i actually did two practice runs one of them was act one to four which i managed to complete in about six hours and then the following day i did act one to five in five hours so i was very happy with that running an act per hour for me is solid given how new i am to the game uh, and from what i gather I think the last five acts are faster than Act 1 to 5 because Act 1 to 5 there's a lot of setup, there's a lot of changing your build and changing gems and changing items, whereas Act 6 to 10 it's a lot smoother. And so given that decent practice, season start came around and this is my journey. I started as a hero fan and I went the usual rolling magma up until Act 3 and this went very smoothly and then i switched around level 30 to armageddon brand with cremation i think this is a tried and tested build and it's there's a reason for it it's very smooth i very much enjoyed it and altogether i was still pretty slow running the campaign nine hours for me i think that's pretty good given that i haven't played this game too much in the last 10 plus years i think nine hours is uh, is a big improvement for me so I was very happy with that. And then we went into white maps. And that's where I want to highlight my first attempt at making my own build in Path of Exile. Prior to that, you know, in Affliction, I was running somebody else's build. I was running SRS Guardian and just following a POB that somebody provided to me. Uh, but this time around, I made sure, even I was, as I was going through League Start, my practice and level 30 plus throughout the campaign, I was not following a POB. I was making sure to pick my own skills and I had a pretty good idea of which skills are high value, which skills were not in terms of the passive tree. And so I went through the entire campaign and into white, yellow, red maps without a POB from somebody else. Just with my own research, with my own intuition about which skill nodes, which passive nodes to pick out, which masteries to pick out. I felt like it went pretty well and it was now finally time for me to do my first respec and try my first Path of Exile build and see how it goes. So what I went for was Arcanist Brand with the Rolling Magma and Archmage support. If you remember, Archmage support, the patch note said that it cannot support brands. However, in this case, it's actually supporting Rolling Magma. It's not supporting Arcanist Brand. Arcanist Brand is not the actual damage skill, so it, it works in this way where you can combo these three and add slower projectiles because rolling magma benefits greatly from that and it's a pretty nifty build where you get seven arcanist brands spamming seven uh rolling magmas at a time and all of these rolling magmas because of their massive aoe bonus from hero fans passive skill tree 
Ascendancy node, they're pretty good at shotgunning enemies. I had really solid single target DPS with this setup. And that was with just four linked gems, like I said, Magma, Brand, Archmage, and Slower Proj. And so as soon as I switched into this build, white maps were pretty smooth. I also made sure to add some defenses in Purity of Elements and Arrogance support. And I made this work with uh, the Ivory Tower unique chest piece. And white maps were good. Then getting into yellow maps, that's around the time when I started feeling a little bit squishier than I'd like. Even the DPS... I mean, it was fine still, but the squishiness was a bigger problem. But even the DPS, I could see uh, it wasn't as much as I would have liked. And also, because of Archmage support, the 5% of your mana being taken away with every single Arcanist brand skill activation of Rolling Magma, this was very heavy mana usage, these three skills. So I was starting to see problems in the build, and I needed to start addressing them. The greatest difference in addressing some of these issues was made by Prism Guardian and adding Determination, Grace, and Wrath, all three of these. Uh, and uh, instead of using Arrogance with Purity of Elements, I comboed it up with Eternal Blessing support gem. So now I was running you know, all of these defensive gems in Determination and Grace. And let me tell you, they make a ridiculous difference. All of a sudden, I went from squishier than paper to being able to run yellow maps no problem. So Determination and Grace are massive defensive layers that now I have learned you want to be running as much as possible, assuming you're not deleting your evasion or your armor, let's say. I was under the impression that armor is not that useful because large hits are basically not mitigated by armor. But it turns out that it's still useful because of when you're running with maps, you're actually getting hit many times by smaller mobs, smaller damage hits. And so determination is actually still fine. To run and it, it still has a, has a big difference in any build. So with this addition to the build I was able to push through yellow maps and I was starting to add other useful uniques like Shaper's Touch, Mind Spiral, Helmet, but as I approached red maps I again started feeling like maybe my DPS was not sufficient and my squishiness was again becoming a problem so it was time to respec once again and this time we went into the Mjolnir Lightning of Conduit of Heavens build uh, together with Archmage support, of course. Uh, and this has been a build that one mana left has been running for a while. And I was basically learning from him and adjusting so that I can actually clear red maps. I added Penance Brand of Dissipation for single target DPS. And that worked quite well. Even though we cannot add Archmage support to Penance Brand, we can still combo it up with Arcane Cloak which is a massive DPS boost for Penance Brand of Dissipation. And you can really feel the difference when you're just spinning with Cyclone and hitting bosses with Lightning Conduit of Heavens versus throwing a couple of Penance Brands of Dissipation, activating your King Cloak, uh, and yes, seeing the bosses melt. It was a pretty decent combo. This one was only for single target and, and you know, mapping was done with Conjured of Heavens pretty much. I did not optimize this enough, however. I didn't worry about the accuracy of the build, the attack speed of the build, cooldowns, and little things like that that actually make a big difference for a Mjolnir build, and I learned that later on. But it was something that still helped me get through red maps. However, I was still squishier than I would have liked. I was dying a lot. I was stuck at around level 90. Because of the deaths that I kept encountering, I cleared red maps, but with far too many deaths. The one thing that actually ended up making a massive difference for me was Coruscating Elixir. For some reason, I thought that because I was running the unique chest piece Ivory Tower, I thought that, well, you know, Chaos Damage is going through my mana. Why would I need Coruscating Elixir to, you know, route it through my energy shield? Well, it turns out, even though we have a massive mana pool, it still gets deleted by Chaos Damage because of the Ivory Tower benefit or buff or whatever you want to call it. Coruscating Elixir actually reduced my death count significantly, so much so that I was able to push uh, through level 91 and 92. Pretty much only, I feel like, because of Coruscating Elixir. Big surprise for me there. I guess it makes sense now that I look back into it. Coruscating Elixir is a massive defensive boost to these uh, low life energy shield mana stacking builds. And then the next thing I did during red maps to boost my character was adding a Necropolis Amulet Giga Craft. My goal for this craft was to get triple attribute, ideally strength int all attributes on the suffixes, and then health and mana on the prefixes. You can be fairly deterministic with this, with the Necropolis Craft. 
uh, you can pretty much guarantee to get three attribute suffixes, not necessarily strength, int, and all attributes, but just three attributes in general, together with health and mana. And there's probably more than a 50% chance to hit that kind of amulet with the right setup in a full Necropolis Gravecraft setup. And I was crafting three amulets at a time. So I did this craft twice. And I'll show you all six amulets from that. And so let me show you my favorite craft out of those six. This is the one that I ended up wearing. It's an agate amulet, so strength int implicit, together with health mana prefixes and energy shield. To me, those are the three best in slot prefixes. So I'm very happy I managed to land those. The suffixes ended up being dexterity, intelligence, all attributes. So if that dexterity was strength, this would have been all six affixes best in slot, together with all of them being tier one and attribute quality, obviously, and primal spirit anointment. We're doing it. A gate amulet. May the glow of Lunaris heal your pains and aid this soldier so that you may Come on! This is all my net worth! All of my net worth in three filthy amulets. I spent ten maybe more divine on this craft. Let's see. Okay, I got three of them. I got three of them. First one. We whiffed on the stats. We whiffed on the attributes. We got mana region instead of the third attribute. But that's okay. It's still pretty damn strong. It's still six tier ones. Okay, next one. Oh, we whiffed again on the triple attributes. That is very low probability to whiff twice. Dexterity all attributes and we got regen. Six tier ones, right? Okay. Okay. Whiffing twice in a row on the attributes is such a low probability. I, th You saw it. I threw basically 16,000% increased attributes. So whiffing twice in a row, there's no chance we whiffed on the third one, right? Strengthened! Oh, but we didn't get the mana! Oh my god, dude! But we got double energy shield. That is interesting. We got strength. How did we not get the mana? So we got some really bad luck. But still, these are all sellable. Very, very high price sellable. But damn, how did we whiff so much? All right, let's do it. A gate, 85, six explicits. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right. Demon Braid, Golem Pendant, and Pain Medallion. Let's see what we got. First one. Strength Int, Dex, Life, Mana, and Rarity. Not bad. Strength Int, Dex, Life, Mana, and Rarity. If the Dex was all attributes, that would have been really, really sweet. But we'll take Dex. It's fine. Strength Int is there. All right, next. Life, Mana, Strength Int, Dex, and Spell Damage. So pretty much the same thing. Except we got spell damage instead of the rarity. The problem here is spell damage on amulet rolls really low. But it should still be sellable. Because people like... It's it's good. Spell damage is actually a good stat to have. So last one. Dex, int, all attributes. Life, mana, percent, energy shield. Oh, if only that dexterity was strength there. Oh my god, we got the percent energy shield with the life, mana roll. So the Necropolis crafting this season has been absolutely ridiculous in being able to get six tier ones fairly deterministically with a lot of the solid tier ones that you might want. So it was quite fun to do that. But even after all of these upgrades, I still felt like my character was not strong enough in terms of DPS to handle bosses. And Lightning Conduit of Heavens is great for clear, but it's just not as good versus bosses. And here is where I want to highlight two massive upgrades that i did the first one was indigon while at the same time solving for the mana issues by getting a mana leech support on my cyclone as well as getting the battle mages cry skill gem and so comboing those up you are able to sustain your mana leech and make the best use out of indigon and get ridiculous spell damage and that is pretty standard for a lot of the mana stacking builds getting indigon and going through that combo but something that i actually made up on my end while also borrowing some parts from other content creators and learning some parts from other people is combining piranga's pact with a natural instinct and healthy mind so there is a video out there 
uh, that combines Paranda's Pact and a Natural Instinct to take advantage of how those interact together. So for example, here you can see I have a Natural Instinct, which gives you all of these small nodes within the range of this jewel, except for the ones I've clicked on. So all of these are now essentially taken. And then if you put Paranda's Pact, Passive Skills in Radius also grant whatever, in my case, plus two attributes, then everything that intersects in this Venn diagram between a natural instinct and Paranda's Pact now gets plus two attributes. So that includes these three and these two and these two. So you can see that's 10 right there and then another six over here, 17. So you're basically getting 34 to all attributes roughly. Uh, just doing that quick math from this Wombo Combo right here. Not only that, but this also benefits a lot of the other nodes that we're going to be specking into regardless. And it gives them plus two to all attributes. And now I'm getting roughly plus 80 to all attributes because of this jam. So it's a very significant bonus. Now, another cool thing is if you slot Healthy Mind on the bottom here, you also convert all of these health nodes into percent mana. So you can see this is 10% mana plus two to all attributes. This one's 20% mana with two to all attributes. And the most funny thing is these ones right here become 8% max mana, and this is another 8% max mana. And they get picked up by the unnatural instinct. So there is some synergy right there between healthy mind and unnatural instinct as well because they can both catch these health nodes. So by specking into this Venn diagram of dual com wombo combo, I was able to basically get double the DPS from my previous passive skill tree setup where I was going in this direction and essentially pathing through the top. Now pathing through the bottom, utilizing these three jewels and being a bit more efficient with my passive skill tree, I was able to yeah get a lot more mileage and on top of that, utilizing Indigon as well, my DPS was through the roof. And mind you, this is only with a level 92 character. The other really interesting thing here with this interaction between Unnatural Instinct and Piranda's Pact is when I was playing around in my POB, as soon as I equipped Unnatural Instinct in this slot right here, it significantly reduced my DPS. And I kept wondering why, why would that happen? That makes no sense. I'm gaining stuff. Why would my DPS go down? And eventually I figured out it was because of Mjolnir's 0.25 second cooldown on triggering a spell. So basically we were in a situation where we took down our proc rate to once every point, let's say two, four seconds. And that did not align well at all with the 0.25 second cooldown. And that's why it significantly reduced our DPS so much so that I kind of had to go down this path if I wanted to retain our DPS. So I had to waste two extra skill points to unlock this basic jewel and to utilize it fully. But thankfully we figured out the alternative solution, which was to get cooldown recovery rate in our belt. And that was a really easy solution. I already had a crafting slot on the belt. So that worked out quite nicely. With that cooldown recovery rate, this is actually the perfect setup it's really high value. We get the attack speed from Harrier as well as these four nodes. I even opted for another 3% attack speed in a jewel. And that puts our attack speed just before that breakpoint of lining it up with the trigger cooldown of Mjolnir. So that was a really cool interaction that I had to figure out by tinkering with POB and eventually with the help of Twitch chat, we figured it out. And this ended up being a really cool setup with a huge DPS increase thanks to all of the attack speed plus the various other nodes and all attributes or alternatively mana that we get from Piranda's Pact. So I wanted to share and highlight this interesting interaction that took me a while to figure out. And so at this point, I was able to kill all of the bosses solo without any issues. I attempted Maven's Invitation the Feared as well. And I was so very close. I was just two bosses left on like 30% health. And given that I'm running Calling Strike, that is five seconds or so worth of DPSing before I would have cleared that. But I ran out of TPs and I was not able to clear uh, Mava's Invitation to Feared, sadly. But overall, my build was finally online. And I was very happy with where I got. And I was very happy with this journey that I went through of trying new things out, being able to implement my own build to a certain degree of success. And I actually think this is definitely a viable build. 
if you try to min max around it and if you know the game a little bit better obviously but i was very happy with how far i got and all of the learnings that i had through this season and through these progression of white yellow ma red maps bosses as well as through my progression with itemization and the passive skill tree learning more about jewels and how big of a difference a single elixir or a single flask can make to the build that is why i want to share all of these learnings with you while including some gameplay footage as well and at the end i decided to move on to other games as well partially because there was a scarab wombo combo that resulted in farm rates of i don't know a thousand times more than regular farm rates basically the economy was somewhat damaged as well because of that so a lot of interesting things going on. But at the same time, I also had a bunch of different games in my backlog. I played Songs of Silence already and Ozzy Mandias. I tried both of these out so far. And next I'm going to be trying the Talos Principles 2, which is a puzzle game that looks very similar to Portal. So I'm very excited for that one as well. And I cannot guarantee that I'm done with this season for Path of Exile. I might go back to it running an SSF character perhaps. I haven't decided yet. I'll see what I feel like in the next however many weeks or months. There are just too many awesome games out there, guys. I cannot help myself. I have to try out as many as I can. And I'll try to report on some of them and which ones I think are worthwhile and which ones I think maybe need to have a little bit more development time. But either way, thank you so much for everybody supporting the channel and everybody who came back on Twitch and helped me learn through this process and help me become a better poe player love you all if you want to check out more of my streams and my progression come by on twitch i'll have it linked in the description below but also let me know what you think of this little lucid art chart i know i tried to do this in paint that seems to be the meta nowadays but i just couldn't you know my i don't know my hand is not accurate enough everything looked super ugly for me so i just threw it together here in lucid charts um, real quick and i don't know i kind of like the layout it seems pretty smooth to me so let me know what you guys think and also let me know if uh you like these kinds of summaries let me know if you would have liked to see a more full video of some of these giga crafts or some of the boss fights uh, i've been kind of busy as well trying to fit too many things and especially with snow melting i'm actually trying to get back into being healthy starting to maybe run a little bit maybe uh go back to the gym as well and so taking care of more than just my gaming habits in life i hope you understand and i hope you're all staying healthy as well because if you want to be gaming in your 60s you gotta make sure you maintain your body for the next few decades all right because that's my plan i'm gonna be a hundred and what 20 years old and i'm gonna be playing whatever rpg is available in the year 2100 i hope to see you all there and with that take it easy everybody enjoy the summer and go chiso samadeshta